it's my great pleasure to introduce today Christoph Zahler from Texas, Arlington, who will be speaking about inferring GUI specifications and implementations from just visual images. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I heard that there are different kinds of talks here, and one can be very interactive. So please don't, um, you know, suppress your questions, ask. Yeah, interaction is good. Okay, so um, first I would like to thank my first author of this paper here, whom I'm going to call Tony throughout this talk, just to confuse you. <laughs> um, so he graduated from UTA uh, with a PhD and is now full-time at Google. So his, it's really um, his idea and he did most of the work, right? So how did this project start? So the project started when Tony um, had an internship um, where he observed teams of professionals creating quite nice uh, mobile form applications. So he basically observed their workflow. And what he observed is that there are at least two different groups of people uh, participating in creating such a mobile phone application. So on the one hand here you have this group of people, uh, graphic designers, artists, etc., which are not necessarily programmers and oftentimes they're not really programmers. And they create very nice uh, user interfaces um, um, in terms of uh, draw drawing them. So basically they are very comfortable with using pencil and paper, um, they like to use um, Photoshop and other design tools. Um, so a characteristic of these uh, user interface is that they're often quite innovative and highly customized and optimized. So um, because of like the competitive um, pressure of the market. So they create these nice interfaces and then they kind of throw them over a wall in terms of uh, maybe PDF files or um, some other pixel-based files like JPEGs, PNGs, etc. And then um, a programmer gets them, right? And the task of the programmer here is to basically recreate this user interface in code. Um, so and then in the end, when you run the code, the code should on screen look like the original screenshot. And this um, process that the programmers go through is very manual and uh, time consuming. So literally, Many programmers have some tool where they measure like the distance between elements on the screen in, in pixels. So they're, they're gonna go here and say, okay, so um, this icon starts 58 pixels here from the border. And then um, the text box starts like 27 pixels from the icon, right? So you can imagine that this is kind of a painful process. So it's clearly error prone and takes time. So, Crystal, if I can mm -hmm. ask something. So, you mentioned that these are non standard UI elements. Do you mean non standard compositions of standard elements? Because presumably they implement them in the end from some GUI library of widgets, perhaps composing them in non standard ways. Right. So, they would use, um, I mean, the uh, one answer to this question is um, if you look at such a screen design, it looks very different from the examples that, for example, Google puts out in terms of uh, how an example application looks like. So they try to get special effects, um, very nice looks um, in their design that looks different from how a standard application looks like. So of course, they have to implement in terms of the standard um, framework in the, in the very end. So you have to combine what's um, already available in the standard libraries. But the goal is to create very fancy and um, optimized looks, right? So are the UI designers aware of this, or do they just draw what they fancy, and then like, you know, it's, the, it's the developer's problem in terms of realizing it? I'm not 100% sure, but I guess there's a combination of both. So I probably try to push boundaries and make their UI um, look special and um, you know, create some kind of a brand for their so does that mean there are like cases where it's just not realizable? Probably, but I have, I have myself not observed that, so I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. But um, another question, I mean, another answer to your question is that um, if you create an a desktop application, maybe in an interactive GUI builder for Windows, 
or Unix, then a button will always look similar because there's just these um, gray borders around an icon, and that's going to be a button, right? But in a, in a mobile phone um, user interface, it's trying to have buttons that just don't look like buttons you're used to in, um, in a desktop application. All right. So that's a manual process, right? And um, so you might be wondering, um, can we just use interactive GUI builders because um, they've been around for a while, right? And uh, major IDEs contain quite nice GUI builders. For example, Xcode for iOS and um, Android Studio from um, Google. And yes, they're there. And you can use them as a programmer easily to um, create some user interface. But they're very complex tools. And there have been studies that um, programmers make a bunch of mistakes when using these existing GUI builders. And also, it's still a manual process. So if you use a GUI builder, you still have to decide which of the existing um, GUI widgets and containers you're going to use. So there are often many alternative options, and um, it's not exactly clear which, which one you want to use. So that's not really a solution. I mean, it doesn't really automate this entire process. OK, so if that uh, sounds bad, then it gets worse, because um, many companies follow an iterative design process. So it's not a one-time deal here, like in waterfall process, but um, uh, there are often many iterations. So there's going to be feedback on this initial version, like from customers or from management or whatever. And um, that means it goes back to the designer. Designer makes some small changes, maybe pushes this icon over by another 13 pixels. So the um, designer creates an updated version of this design document again puts it over the fence to the developer, and the developer first has to figure out where the changes are and then reflect them again into the source code. So it's just a um, yeah, long process. And Tony basically thought, maybe we can automate some of this right, and increase efficiency here. So the goal clearly is not to fire all the developers, but to um, allow developers to focus on more high value activities and maybe more interesting activities than just to recreate um, user interfaces in code. So the motivation, it's um, pretty clear that mobile phone applications are here um, and um, on a massive scale, right? So there's um, more than 90% of the US population over 16 years has a phone, mobile phone, <coughs> and more than half are smartphones. There are more than 1 million Android applications at this point. Um, the, the applications are used for many tasks, um, lots of things we do on desktops and games and maps and navigation and lots of things. So it, there's a, obviously a large consumer focus here and there's um, lots of competition so that drives um, innovation in user interfaces, right? That leads to all these specializations and uh, optimizations. All right, so um, in some sense this is a reverse engineering task. And it sounds a little strange because so far we've just seen a forward engineering process, right, where somebody creates a new application from scratch. But within this forward process, there's a reverse engineering step because the um, programmer had observed some concrete um, data points, like um, two, for example, um, one screenshot uh, that shows, shows the application in one particular state. And then the programmer tries to infer from that particular data point a, some general principles that um, will allow it to, again, regenerate this concrete screenshot under some configuration, right? So it's conceptually it's similar to a reverse engineering task where, for example, in Daikon, um, you observe a few data points, and from those data points, you infer some general principles. And in addition to that kind of, um, in software engineering, standard reverse engineering idea, as an addition, compl additional complication here, where um, some, de some designers create the designs with um, pencil and paper. So you have um, handwriting and um, some not straight lines, and then you get all these imperfections of um, dealing with a scan of that. So usually you do not have that complication in normal reverse engineering tasks, because usually you have everything in, um, in, in some formal language. So it's clear where I'm getting at with this is that there's going to be clearly a heuristic process here, right? Because 
And with all these imperfections, um, there's not going to be perfect solutions. Okay, so at this point, you might be wondering, um, this is a forward engineering process, right? Why is there a reverse engineering step? Is it just a completely artificial thing? Um, why do we need reverse engineering in there? Why don't the graphic designers just specify the user, how the user interface looks like in some formal language, which then can easily be translated into code, right? So there have been a bunch of um, uh, research tools and approaches where um, then some nice formal uh, language has been specified, and then developers can specify their layout in that, and then there's a compiler just to compile it to some, some kind of a code. So that uh, might work nicely, but today we're not there, because um, today graphic designers just not use these uh, formal languages. Right, so today graphic designers use um, lots of paper and pencil and Photoshop and similar design tools. So that might be an indication issue that just the um, graphic designers are used to certain kind of tools and that's why they use them. And if we would train them in the future using some different tools, then they might just switch over. But there might, uh, there might also be a different reason here, which is that graphic designers might just fundamentally think in different abstractions than programmers. While programmers are comfortable thinking in tree structures, and the UI hierarchy is a tree structure, graphic designers seem to think more um, you know, in a more flat structure that just looks like a grid that basically shows the layout of a two-dimensional area. All right, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that um, I'm happy to take questions at any point, so it's, um, um, I'm happy to make it interactive. So we are at the point where um, uh, we said that uh, there's a reverse engineering step in a forward engineering process. And now, um, as of a high-level high example of how this works, so we start out with um, a screenshot. And um, at a high level, what a programmer is doing when um, he or she processes the screenshot is identifying the different elements in that screen. So um, major elements are where's text in the screen and where are uh, images in the screen. So um, our task is to, I mean, or we um, simulate these steps that the programmer um, is doing. So we also try to identify where are the images and where is the text. And then since a UI hierarchy is a some kind of a tree structure, we also identify elements that should be grouped together either because they conceptually belong together or because they're part of some collection. Okay, once we have that, we can export uh, these identified elements and um, compile them for some platform and run them on, um, as an application on a mobile device. So that basically yields a runnable exec, uh, application that just recreates the look, the user interface problem. And then the programmer would add the programming logic, like connected to data sources, et cetera. So a bit of background in, uh, on uh, user interface hierarchies. It's um, basically a tree structure where you have some root node which occupies the entire area of the application and on a mobile phone that's typically the entire screen. And that's a container which has a lot of transitive children. So in this concrete case, it's a screenshot of the Google Hangout application taken on iOS. And this um, Hangout application um, has, the root node has uh, three direct children. One is the top bar here that contains the image of the user and then one more icon. And then in the middle, there's this list. And on the bottom, there's this row of four icons. Each has its own label. And you can recursively <laughs> dig into this tree. For example, here, if you look at one of these list um, items, 
Then again, there's an icon here on the left and a text, which is actually a container. So it again contains two child nodes and another text item here, which is a time. And finally, an image to separate two items in that list. OK, so um, just as a background on Android, which is also similar in other modern um, uh, systems, is that these UI hierarchies are created by a mix of declarative and imperative elements. So traditionally, um, many applications are um, constructed by like one piece of code that basically creates all the different elements and then arrange them in some tree structure. But now modern um, frameworks like Android and iOS, they recommend uh, using a lot of declarative components because you know, they're relatively easy to reason about. And what we end up usually is a mix of declarative elements and imperative elements. So in this example here, we just look at one item of this list. Um, this is a concrete example how um, generated by our tool, um, how we can uh, create this. It's basically a container that's called a relative layout. And a relative layout, um, you can specify each child node relative to either the parent or some other child nodes. So you see these little red arrows that indicate how um, the location is defined. All right, and then this container, so this is basically some XML file here. Um, just um, for one of the elements, we show some examples. Where, for example, we can specify what's the height and the width and the margin and how it's aligned to other elements in the container. OK, so that's a mapping here. And um, once you, we created this tree structure, we use some imperative code to fill that structure with concrete data values. So that's here some Java code, which just um, puts some concrete elements into uh, a, a container. So I said earlier that uh, the existing um, frameworks can be quite complex and confusing. So um, that's a snapshot from 2012, a survey of the 400 most popular non-game apps in um, the Google Play Store, which just basically counted which kind of um, user interface items applications use. And these are just the top items here for both containers and widgets. So for example, here, the most used um, uh, container type is a linear layout, which is used on average 130 times per application. But then there's also a relative layout we see also, uh, we've seen on the last slide, which is used 47 times per application. And then similar for the widgets, there's text and image, which are the two top ones, and button. And some of them are very similar in um, functionality, so you have to know which one you want to use. OK, so we said that we want to identify the text elements. And luckily, there has been uh, decades of research in um, recognizing text. So we're not going to try to reinvent the wheel here. And instead, we just use an existing powerful framework for detecting text. So we specifically use a Tesseract system, which is an open source OCR tool, which is quite powerful in some aspects, as powerful as commercial tools. And so these existing OCR tools work very well for classical text character recognition, for example. If you have a um, newspaper page or single column um, paper, then uh, these tools have very high performance. On the other hand, a screenshot of a mobile phone application looks a little different because, as you see, the text is a lot um, sparser here on this page, right? And there's also a mix of text and other elements like pictures, so which leads to low performance of OCR. 
So the same example and um, applied um, with Tesseract without training in different modes of Tesseract. So um, there's several modes, for example, um, detecting individual words, detecting lines, blocks, and paragraphs. And we see that while um, the performance is quite good for a lot of these words, which are nicely detected here, there are also some issues in this um, detection result. For example, this huge box here does not really uh, capture any word or, or letter, right? It's just the combination of the, all these icons. And it gets worse over here, where there's even um, you know, worse results, like combining all these elements, all these icons and text into one big block or paragraph. So from reviewing this performance, we ruled out these block and paragraph modes, and instead focused on word and line mode. But still clear that we need to do some post-processing here to uh, improve perf the performance of the, the tool. Sorry, so with mm -hmm. like, the input being like a handwritten drawing, make this problem easier or? Harder. Harder, I see. Because with a handwritten example or hand-drawn, we have all the problems you have here plus additional ones that um, there's a lot more degree of freedom in how a single letter can look like, right? So it is a lot harder to make correct guesses on what a particular image actually is in terms of um, letters. All right. So to address this issue and the um, you know, overall workflow is that we start out with um, OCR to detect where the text is and also extract the text. And then we have various other steps to um, post-process um, the results and also to figure out where the other components are in, in the page. So for example, we would like to know where all the um, different images are. And for that, we again use an existing computer vision technique. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel either. So there's a very powerful uh, computer vision tool that we can also uh, use. And we try to combine those to you know, get a heuristically good result for um, our scenario here of understanding um, screenshots. So at the high level, we you know, have some you know, domain-specific um, heuristics. For example, we know that if one dimension, one dimension of a word detected by OCR is zero, then it is very likely not an actual word, right? So H is the height reported by OCR for a word. W is the width. And then similar heuristics, if um, the aspect ratio of a word is um, very skewed, like for example, a very, very, very long and very um, low word. It's not really a word in the English language, or a word that is just very um, high and thin is also not a word. Right. So based, um, right. And similarly, um, we use the domain-specific heuristic that a, on a mobile phone screen, words are typically not cut off at the border. Right. So if um, OCR reports that a word starts outside of the screen area, then we're also going to just reject that word. How can you report that it's off the screen? Um, if, um, is that if, if what, there's one character that's half off the screen, then we'll assume that that character is whole? Right, that we only see um, half of this character. Right. Okay, fine. Or if OCR, um, so OCR reports the width, height, its own confidence level, and um, the font family detected, and the font size it detected. So based on that information, we can um, estimate the amount of space a word should take, because we can just um, you know, combine, uh, basically render ourselves a, this particular reported word in the specific font family, the specific um, <coughs> size, and then just compute how big it should be. And if that differs significantly from the dimensions OCR reported, then we're also going to just recheck that. 
Right, here's a concrete example from Google Hangouts where um, the text that reported is eight and it does not fit with the reported um, dimensions and our estimate. So we can reject this as not being a word over here. Okay, once we have an initial version of the what, what are the words and what's the context of the word, we um, create a first shot at the UI hierarchy using computer vision. And there are competing goals here. So on the one hand, you want the uh, inferred hierarchy to be minimal because a minimal hierarchy leads to less clutter, right? Uh, I mean, the, a small hierarchy means that the program only has to understand a limited number of levels and limited number of nodes. And also, it leads to faster rendering because the way the um, UI frameworks render is they first uh, render a parent node and then um, render the children on top of the parent. So whenever you have overlap between nodes or you have lots of nested children, then you do a lot of overpainting, which can lead to uh, low performance. So basically, you want a small hierarchy. On the other hand, you don't want the minimal hierarchy where you just have a single node, which is the entire screenshot, right? So that's not good either. Because you also want to have some flexibility. So um, if some things do not conceptually belong to each other, they should not be in the same container to allow the image to scale to different uh, um, aspect ratios and different um, form factors. So the other extreme case is that you do not want every single character in its own node. Uh, because yes, it's very flexible, but it's just too much. It leads to deep hierarchies. OK, so um, use a standard computer vision tool, OpenCV, where we try to identify the um, atomic elements, which are things that should not be further subdivided. Uh, because sometimes there are things very close by that should really belong into the same image. And um, we want to make sure that they do not lead to separate images. So the first step is use uh, the canny algorithm, which identifies edges. And then you see that um, it leads to a bunch of noise and open shapes. And also, it leads here that to that um, several characters are separate. And we want to merge those together so they become unique. I mean, they become um, atomic small elements. So in order to do this, we um, dilate these edges to kind of blur them together. Then compute contours, which says the boundaries. And finally, compute the bounding boxes of those um, contours. So these bounding boxes is the first shot at the uh, UI hierarchy. Then we can figure out which of these boxes overlap and which are nesting each other. Okay, so then now we have the result of um, computer vision OCR, and we can use the computer vision results to um, further uh, post-process the OCR results. So for example, here we have this case where there actually was my face in here, where um, OCR identified that a part of this face is actually a character. So then um, computer vision rep identifies uh, here a bounding box around this entire picture. And then if we overlap those with each other, then we can figure out that yes, this should really be um, an image um, because it's just a small part here of that image. So it, it's not going to be its own uh, bird or character. Right? And to do that, we have another set of domain-specific uh, domain heuristics. So it was just an example of heuristic five. All right, so then um, we want to combine words that belong to each other in lines and text boxes. So we merge those um, words that we identified. 
And once we have merged words that are close to each other, uh, it's good to rerun OCR on these identified text areas because if you run OCR on a specific area, then you can get better text detection results. Oops, there's an animation. All right, so we can then merge text lines that are close to each other. And get them in, put them into a container. And once we have that, we can identify lists. So things that um, are repeated over and over, but don't have to be exactly identical. So to do this, we first find things that are indeed identical across um, the screen. So we, here, in this case, we find that these things are the same, just repeated. Once we have that, we have uh, basically a candidate area of things that might be um, a list item. Question. Mm -hmm. What defines them as being the same? Um, dimension and distance, I believe. Okay. They can probably... From each other or the edge or... I'm not sure. You can probably plug in your okay. own heuristic there, but okay. yeah, it's probably the alignment and the size. But the content doesn't matter. This is no. purely based on bounding boxes. Yes, it's purely based on bounding boxes. Right. So once we have identified such repeated items, we uh, just see what else is in that area, and then capture this as things that can change between items. So here, in this example, we have those two items which are also a part of this list item but can differ between elements. Do you define what is the yellow area? Uh, that's... Basically, um, I would say the minimum area where um, the repeated elements, uh, the minimum bounding box around the repeated elements then you would get something just around the green squares, right? Well, but we identified also the blue thing is also repeated. Oh, I see. Yeah. So the blue uh, is this separating line, which in this user interface shows that there's um, this is a separator between uh, this So items. without the blue line, you would not encapsulate the red boxes. So if you identify that uh, green plus blue should belong into one container, then now we can capture everything that is in that bounding box defined by green and blue. All right, so we, had, we capture those. So do you now go back to the identification of the boxes, for example, the red boxes, and you could say, hmm, they are part of a list, and therefore they more likely to be identical semantically. You could make corrections in how you encapsulate these things. Yeah. Yeah, you could say that now these should all be the same. Or we could um, say that we should just find the biggest one that contains all others and use that biggest one to represent all of them. Yeah. OK, so once we have identified all these things, we can export them. For example, crop, extract, identify, Im identified images, export um, all the text values you found. One advantage of that is that the generated application contains all the text values and therefore looks similar to what the designer provided. And therefore, it's maybe easier to understand for the designer and for other stakeholders, as opposed to just say text, 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 right? So we want the original text values to show up in the generated application, basically. All right, and then we also capture the background color of containers to make it look mm, similar. And finally, generate the Java code to fill a um, list with the content we found. OK, so we've um, implemented this entire thing for Android. So we use TestDirect and OpenCV for, Open for OCR and um, computer vision. So uh, the generator picks between the three most popular 
container types and widget types when constructing the um, user interface hierarchy. And then the, currently the aspect ratio of the generated application is the same as that of the input screenshot. So it's um, resolution independent, so it can scale to multiple screen sizes, but at this point we do not support different aspect ratios. And here's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is the thing to the right what you generated? Right. Why is, why is there this gap in the list to the last step? Oh, that's a good question. Um, one person is paying it, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's um, a problem in, um, <coughs> that, that's a problem basically. So if you look here, not entirely sure. Is it, so it only detected five elements in their list, right? So did it think that the last element is, is just like a fixed, Oh, it's a fixed half visible thing. Yeah, because it's just, yeah. And the, yeah. the size of this, yes, the size of the separators is smaller. So right. stuff got jammed up toward the top. Yes, it does not belong uh, it to It has no this. way of knowing what's underneath, right? It doesn't yeah. know how to fill that, uh, the bottom third of the circle in. Right, so it does not belong to this collection here, right? Because here- It's not exactly the same. Right, this guy was cut off here, right? Half cut off. Um, so, which leads to a very different kind of detection here. So that's because this looks so different, it is, does not end, end up in a collection. So that's just one example of this being a really heuristic process, right? <coughs> Programmer will have to go in and make some kind of changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. A related question perhaps mm -hmm. is that the list is dynamic in content. Yes. In the final application, yeah. Should be. Do you, do you generate that dynamic adapter or that's up to the program? It's up to the program at this point. I mean, we have ideas of connecting that to data sources and all that, but at this point it's just um, basically a collection um, in there and we and, and the general program feeds this set of five into that collection at this point. It's just hard-coded at this point. That's just those five going there. <coughs> all right, great. Uh, right, so here's an example of using this on um, pencil on paper. So in this case, um, a student took the screenshot and drew, recreated that by drawing um, with paper, which leads also in this example to relatively nice results. I have a question. So, mm -hmm. um, so how does it prevent it from generating like the text size to be exactly that uh, width? Or maybe that's what it does. Because in general, it's going to be dynamic, right? So mm -hmm. like, you know, it depends on the, the length of the actual text, right? But so how does it make sure that like, doesn't hardwire? Right, right now it's hot. And right now it's hardwired. I see. Okay. But you're right. It should instead um, compute the biggest box, biggest bounding boxes, and then a big bounding box, and then use that to represent all of these items. Right. That, that would be better. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay, so that's a concrete example here, a use case, but we also have a more um, extensive study. So we asked basically three research questions. The first is, what's the runtime? So we implemented this as I said for Android, so uh, what's the runtime of this thing? What's, the second one is, what's the pixel by pixel similarity? If we take the original input image and compare it with a screenshot of our generated application. Um, so the expectations are that uh, it's probably not going to run in interactively because there are these relatively expensive open, um, OCR and computer vision tasks. And for the second one, we are not at this point uh, supporting all kinds of applications. For example, games are pretty hard because they do not use these um, UI hierarchies. Instead, they might draw directly on the screen of OpenGL. So we're not touching those at all at this point. Okay, so um, it's clear that pixel to pixel similarity is not enough because it would invite this very um, simple solution of just showing this entire screenshot as a single item hierarchy. So we also compare the structure of um, the generated application with the structure of the input application. And at this point, it becomes clear that 
we want to use subjects that are actually existing applications, not just screenshots, because otherwise we do not have access to um, the runtime hierarchies. So the workflow is we take a subject, we run it on a mobile phone, we capture at the same time screenshot and runtime hierarchy, then we only give um, the screenshot to our tool, which runs on some developer machine, this MacBook Pro here. Um, then our tool generates source code, we compile the source code, run it on a, on a phone, and um, again, capture screenshot and runtime hierarchy. Okay, so our tool Remaui does not actually need um, rooted or jailbroken phones. We only need this for this particular experiment here, right? Because we need to capture the runtime hierarchy of the applications and we only knew how to do this when we root the phone. But if you, as a, as a consumer if, or as a designer, if you use our tool, then you do not have to do that. Okay, so for the concrete subjects, we basically picked um, the top 100 free applications from both um, the Google um, Store and the Apple Store. And then we excluded all applications which are games, um, just to get rid of all the OpenGL issues. So um, we have um, five different groups. The first group takes uh, the, from the top 100 iOS applications, <coughs> um, tries to reach all screens, and then take a screenshot of the screen. Group B does the same, but only for the main screen of the application. Group C is the main screen of the Android applications. Then D is a main screen of 58 other iOS applications which are outside of the top 100, but come from um, Google and Apple. So there's Apple and um, Google applications because we figured that those companies are pretty sophisticated and we wanted to see how the supposedly well-designed um, applications behave. Then group E is um, that you manually recreated uh, screenshots by hand and with um, pencil and paper. So resulting applications, the resulting 488 subjects it's kind of a cross-section of um, e-commerce, email, maps, media players, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's a good variety in there. And the concrete list of applications we used is on uh, Tony's web page. So to answer the first research question, the average runtime of Remaui, the tool to parse the screenshots and generate um, source code, it was nine seconds. So this um, plot shows the different processing steps of Remaui. And for each step, it also breaks it down by the different five different groups, A to E, we've seen earlier. And finally, also the total runtime. So what we see here is that a few groups take a lot of the time. So this guy lost in this one. And that's because in those steps, we run these external tools, OpenCR, uh, OpenCV, sorry, and um, Tesseract, the OCR and the computer vision tools. So this step has a big variety because um, in this step we run OCR again on identified lines. So it depends on the number of lines in a screenshot how often we run OCR. So that's why you get the big variety here. For the second research question, we um, did pixel by pixel similarity. Basically we use two standard metrics to compare um, how similar pixels are. Uh, so it's relatively simple here. Uh, you uh, start at the left top of a screenshot and look at the first pixel, and then uh, look at for each pixel at the three different color channels, R, G, and B, and just compare it with the corresponding pixels, R, G, B channels on the generated um, screenshot. Just assumes the screens are the exact same size. Yeah, yep. Okay. And you also have to be careful to um, take care of the uh, standard iOS um, top and lower bar, but we just assume that you know, we take care of these issues. Yes, so, so you do that, and you see pretty high uh, similarity um, across the board, really. So that's great. 
But then for the third research question, we also compared um, the structure, right? So we tried to compare the hierarchy. So that's um, more difficult because it's not entirely clear what's the gold standard here, right? Um, first, a given screenshot can be produced by many different user interface hierarchies. Uh, so there's lots of things to choose from. And, and second, the um, hierarchy that the existing application has or uses is not necessarily the ideal hierarchy. So we found several cases where the existing application has things we consider bugs because there were, were containers that basically have the exact same dimensions as their parent and it did not serve any obvious reason. So it's, it seems really redundant. So if we would rewrite the application, we'd just throw those out. And there were also other cases where we would refactor an existing um, user interface hierarchy to reduce the number of nodes. So it's not entirely clear that the, that the existing hierarchy should be the gold standard. So to sidestep these issues. So we're starting to run out of time, just so you know. Oh, OK. Um, all right. Still a little bit. Good. How much? Five, less than five minutes. All right. So I'm almost done with your evaluation. And then you can ask questions too, maybe. Um, Right, so aside that these problems we just compared at the leaf level. So we just looked at all the leaf, leaf nodes and um, checked if they are of the right type. Right? And um, so a main task was to uh, identify text and image nodes, right? So we just compare pixel by pixel if, a, for example, for text, if a generated text area how it overlaps with the original text area. So and then if you have these pixels of the original and the generated text area, you can just compute standard precision and recall values um, separately and together. So the result here is um, not as strong as we hoped for. So you see relatively low values of precision, especially for recall. Um, and since it also involves manual steps, so we um, you know, restricted it to two groups. So we, did, we dug a little deeper into one of them for um, text recall. And what we found is a possible culprit. Here's white space. So here you see a one item of this list. And you see, first of all, you see a lot of white space in this item, right? And the white space is handled differently in the original application and in the generated application. So uh, for example, here, this um, text box captures much of this white space and we just don't, right? So that's why this metric might not be the best metric to measure similarity. Um, so a little bit deeper analysis, we also looked at the edit distance between original strings and the generator strings. So for these two groups, for example, in group B, we had about 3,000 pairs of strings. Uh, on average, the original string length is 14.6 characters. The remote generator is 15.0 and at a distance of 2.9 on average. That indicates that the recall is actually not as bad as it seems on the previous slide. Okay, I'm gonna skip the other observations here. And there's lots of related work, but um, they typically build on different sets of assumptions. For example, for desktop applications, you have a different set of assumptions. And other um, Related work assumes that you have runtime information, which we don't. OK, so I'll open it for questions. If you don't have any questions, you can also talk a little bit about exploring commercialization um, ideas we had. Okay, question. Well, once I have the UI code, mm -hmm. um, how hard is it to actually like, hook the application logic into it? Well, uh, you get the source code, and then you have to change the source code, right? what the program typically does. I mean, I guess it seems like it's somewhat analogous to the problem of I have a parser generator, mm -hmm. and now I have to figure out how to hook that into AST, those ASTs in the rest of my compiler or something. But I guess, I don't know, I, I've never done this, so I was wondering if you have a sense for what does the generated code look like? Um, well, I have like these nested lists and lists and lists. 
Mm -hmm. I, I need something to populate them. How do I get a handle to it and then put the right data into those items? So there's, um, in the slides, there is uh, this link to this web page where you can try it out yourself. But if you do that for the um, example that I've shown, then you get this kind of stuff. For example, there's an XML file. Um, you just get a bunch of, yeah, you get a bunch of standard XML files and Java files, and then you know you have to edit those. So there's just like some name that I say, like append to that name, and it things will show up, or. So you basically need to add IDs to each of the elements in Android at least, and mm -hmm. then you just hook up the code, the controller thing, to say, okay, this for this particular ID, I wanted to be connected this way. What gets shown, what gets shown. It's kind of like using like the DOM or something, or like yeah. jQuery yeah. or something yeah. like that. Right. I see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I'm curious to how this approach works with respect to like more modern like multi device layouts because I know that Apple and some other uh, some some newer APIs that they're releasing have like auto layout features where like they are taking care of repainting for you with multiple layouts. But like, you know, on the web and other programming models, you sort of have multiple layouts. You want to take, you want to synthesize a set of like a single chunk of code that can figure out how to do all layouts. You know, like a lot of the mobile apps and other things have this problem where like I have end devices and for each device I'm handwriting code for each mm -hmm. thing, like laying the buttons out or adjusting the fonts. Or, right. Uh, do you think that it would be easy to do this of like, View eight layouts, extract them, and then synthesize a common description from all eight. Or it, I guess I'm just curious about that because like one of our line mates has been working on doing this with CSS. Mm -hmm. The nice thing he gets is if I give it any examples, like it can find something that is representative of those n examples that I've given it. Yeah, I mean you haven't done any of this, but you could imagine that the designer provides um, screenshots of different for different form factors, mm -hmm. and we parse all of them and combine them into a single application. That's kind of the answer, I guess. Okay. We should probably let people go, because I know some people have to go at 4.30. But uh, Christoph, I'm sure, will stick around and talk to us some more. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.